All right, everybody. How are you doing this morning? I'm so glad you're here for our 11 a.m. service. And man, it's just going to be a great time together in God's Word. If you've got a Bible, if you've got a notebook with you, make sure you take that out. We're going to discover a whole lot together. And if you don't own a Bible, we've got Bibles in the back. So make sure you stop by our welcome area on your way out. We'll give you that. Uh, of course, we'll have uh, the scripture right here on the screen. But today, I want to begin by quoting the great reformer of our time, Drake, and let you know that we're going to talk about God's plan today. Who's excited to talk about God's plan for our lives? Awesome. We're going to have a good time together. You know, you right now and me, we are living out of someone's plan for our lives. Every single one of us are executing a plan. And, and maybe for you, the plan that you are executing is the one that you created for your life. When you were younger, you had a dream to become uh, a police officer, a, a teacher. You just wanted to be a mom, whatever it is. And you had this plan. And if it required schooling, you went to school, you graduated, you got the degree, you've got the career now. And you form the plan and you're living out the plan. Maybe it has to do with where you're living, the, the town that you're in. Maybe for you, the plan that you're living out was formed by your family that your family placed expectations on you for sports or for the family business. And you've kind of just been living out of that to honor your family. Maybe the plan that you're living out was formed by culture. Culture said, here's what you should do with your life. Here's the best career path. Here, here's how you should uh, navigate your relationships. Here's where you should live. And you took in what culture said, and you're now executing it. What I want you and I to realize today is this. Every single one of us are living out a plan for our lives that either we've created, culture's created, or as we're going to discover today, God has created for us. And when you put those elements on the table, we all have free will to say, I'm going to live out my plans for my life, or I'm going to do what's socially acceptable and expected, or I'm going to live out what God has planned for me. God's plans and principles. And how many would agree and say oftentimes God's plans and principles for our lives are very countercultural, yeah. right? right? It's not normal. Yeah. And so today what we're going to do is we are going to look at God's plan by getting into Ruth chapter 3. And specifically, we are going to talk about God's plan for sex and God's plan for marriage. Now I need everybody to do me a favor, take a deep breath in and take a deep breath out. Okay, so at any point during the message, if you feel a little tense or awkward, just do that exercise. You're all prepared, okay? <laughs> this is big people church. So yes, we're going to talk about God's plan as it relates to sex and marriage. And here's why. Because culture's talking about this every day. Because you and I are navigating this topic every day anyway. So why would we not say, okay, especially if you're a Christ follower— why would we not say, God, what is your plan as it relates to sex in my life? What is your plan as it relates to romantic relationship? What's your plan as it relates to marriage? Because we're already getting from Netflix originals, from social media scrolling, from news highlights, maybe from the environment you grew up in or the environment you've now created, you're already getting a plan. So today, I want to show you God's plan as it relates to this. And there will be moments where it'll be awkward, where it'll be tense, where you'll feel like I am right in your kitchen with you and you'll want to kick me out. <laughs> and that's all right. But if we can just approach this with some humility and say, what is God's plan I believe that we can discover something great. And this is not just for you if you are single or if you are married. It's not for you if you are living with someone or if you're not living with someone. This is for all of us. Say that with me. All of us. This is for all of us to discover. Now, to do that, we are going to look at chapter 3 of Ruth. Last week, Joe Coyote did an incredible job leading us through chapter 2. And if you're here or you remember, he, he stood up here and said, Okay, i got to leave you on a cliffhanger. Because chapter 2 simply ends with Ruth and Naomi coming together. They've got some grain that Boaz has provided for them, but we didn't see anything happen between Boaz and Ruth. How many want to see something happen between Boaz and Ruth? Come on, it's all right. It's church. It's like, come on, I want to see the story unfold. Uh, are there sparks between them? I mean, are they going to end up together? Why did the chapter just end? And today I have the privilege to open up the book and read chapter 3 where we'll discover if something happens between Boaz and Ruth. And the word that's going to guide our conversation together is this word, integrity. We are going to look and see two individuals, a 
Moabite woman. And again, if you're not familiar with that term, the people of Moab were the enemies of Israel. They had horrible practices. They worshiped other gods. And to worship those gods, they would sacrifice their children to those gods. They were against the people of Israel. And yet here we have a Moabite woman who has come into the land of Israel with her Jewish mother-in-law, Naomi, and they're both widowed. They're both not taken care of. They both don't have that provider in their lives. And in this culture, for a Moabite woman to be living in Bethlehem, it means her future is very, very bleak. There's no hope. She is destitute. She is impoverished. She has nothing of hope unless someone will redeem her, get her free, cover her, protect her. And so Ruth and Naomi are here, and we leave off with this man, Boaz, who we find out is a kinsman redeemer, a family member of Elimelech, the former husband who passed away of Naomi. Boaz is related, which according to the law means he could actually redeem them. He could purchase their property, not for selfish gain, but to provide for them. He could rightfully marry Ruth to protect her and care for her. And we're kind of left on the edge of our seat saying, well, is he going to do it? Like, what's going to happen here? And so as we look at these two, and we really just look at one night that they have together, we will discover how they navigate aspects of our lives that we continue to navigate today, married or single, and they do so with integrity. So let's look. Ruth chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And to frame this, I'm going to move through by showing you the plan that Naomi has, the proposal, the promise, and the provision. And so if you're taking notes, you can write those things down. The plan, the proposal, the promise, and the provision. I was told in Bible school that it only counts if it all starts with the same letter. So I've tried to stay true to that. Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well, say this word with me, provided for. Now, what's so interesting about that is that Naomi, if you remember, when she came back to Bethlehem at the end of chapter one, she told everyone, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. I am bitter. I am empty. And she was selfish. She made it all about her. And now we're getting a glimpse at someone who's saying, I need to provide for someone else. What has happened to selfish, bitter Naomi? And what's happened is during their time in Bethlehem, she is experiencing the kindness of God. The Hebrew word is chased. I tried to do that with a little ch part. Right? Chased. It's the kindness of God. And that kindness is melting her hard heart. And today, if your heart is hard to Jesus, if you say, but so much of my life has been lacking, I, I don't know if I can trust this God, rules and laws will not soften your heart. Being told what you have to do won't soften yeah. your heart. Yeah. That won't lead you to repentance. It is only the kindness of our God. Yeah. It's that God loves you. It's that he's got a good plan for your life. It's that Jesus came and died on the cross for you. And Naomi in the land of bread in Bethlehem is experiencing the kindness of God. Yeah. And now she's saying, well, God has provided for me. I got to provide for you, Ruth. She's looking at this young Moabite girl saying, you have no future if you don't have provision. I've got to get a home for you. But what I notice in this verse is that Naomi's not your normal Christian. <laughs> Explain what that means. Do you notice there's nothing there about, we got to pray about this. <laughs> you know, Ruth, we got to have a prayer meeting to get you a house. That's, we got we to gotta, we gotta just go before the Lord and pray and pray. And pray. Now listen, pray first is our belief here. Can I get a good amen there? We believe, pray first before all things. But too oftentimes what we end up doing is we just pray about something that God's saying, um, bro, let's go. <laughs> like, you don't have to pray about this one because you already know my plan for your life. It's time for you to get up and do. Say that word with me. Do. Action. Let me give you some examples. This will cause us all to feel uncomfortable. Just do your breathing exercise. That's all right. <laughs> Maybe for you, your prayer is, God, give me a job. And yet you're turning down all the jobs that God's providing because you don't like it. God, just heal me. And yet you're not choosing to live a healthy lifestyle that God can work through. I love this one. God, speak to me. I need a word from the Lord. Like you do it like that. Like you, you just go in. And God's like, um, 
I gave you 66 books of words. <laughs> like open your Bible, commune with me, read, and you'll hear me. Stop praying that you need a word from me. Just do, act. God, just give me more money. And yet you're not faithful with the resources he's given you. So why would he trust you with more if you're not tithing with what you have now? Or this one, since we're talking about marriage and sexuality, God, I just want to be married. I just want to feel complete. I just want to feel whole. But you're not living a life of integrity. So why in the world would the king of the universe trust you with one of his daughters? Why would he bring someone into your life when you're not living with integrity now? See, what Naomi recognizes is this, Ruth, we've got to act. We've got to do. There's, there's a plan that needs to be set in place. So look at her plan. She says this in verse two, now Boaz with whose woman you have worked is a relative of ours. And tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. And what that simply means is this, it is the barley harvest. And after working all day in the field, the field owner would go back to the threshing floor, which was this place located at a certain point in the, the city where the wind at night could kind of come through. And they would take their grain, put it on the floor, and they would take big bundles and just throw it into the air. It's just a bunch of squats, bro. That's it. Just, just a whole bunch of squats. And as they threw it, the wind would drive away the chaff, the part of the grain that was not used. And by the end of their time, they would start to hear more kernels dropping. And once all the chaff was gone, they would scoop up their grain and haul it off. You thought our jobs was hard, right? Imagine that all night. Just, and so Naomi says, it's barley season. He's a field owner. Tonight, he's going to be winnowing on the threshing floor. So she knows where he's going to be. Now look what she says. I love this. Here's the plan. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Come on, Naomi's like, Ruth, we're going to set you up for something good. We're going to get you to smell good, to look good. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. And he will tell you what to do. All right. So I need a little disclaimer here. A lot of what we're going to read today is going to be descriptive, not prescriptive. There's a difference. A description is simply just an account of what is taking place. Remember, this is ancient literature. This is a totally different time, totally different culture. So a lot of what the author tells us is a description of what happened that the original audience would have been totally normal with. Oh yeah, she went and uncovered his feet. <laughs> Duh. And we're like, what? <laughs> like, am I supposed to, is that how I get a date? Is that why I'm still single? I've never uncovered someone's feet. So we're not, we're going to find some application together for our lives, but there is a lot of this that's just description of what they did in this culture, but there is prescription as well. And so there's some good stuff here. I mean, it's just a little free advice. It is worth the price of admission. So just take a shower <laughs> and put on a little cologne. It don't hurt. Get some good clothes on and, and, and be a little impressive for, for whoever it is. And so Naomi says, here's the plan. This is what we're going to do. But what I want you to see about this is that this is very risky for Ruth to do. Remember, we have a Moabite woman now going to a place where Jewish men worked. Women didn't go there. And she's going to go as an enemy of Israel by nature of her origin and her country. And she is going to approach a man and go through this custom, this ritual of uncovering his feet and then just cuddling up next to him. And we're going to discover what that really means in a moment. But this is risky. And here's why. Boaz, being the Jewish man in this situation, if he wakes up groggy, if he wakes up angry, if he wakes up like, why are my feet cold? <laughs> that worked hard all day, not for cold feet. Who likes cold feet when you're sleeping? Nobody. If he wakes up in any sort of mood where he says, who are you? He could demand that this woman is shamed. In fact, he could accuse her of prostitution. Oh, the reason you're here culture would say you're just here for a one night stand you're just here to get a sexual need met and he could say this is prostitution let's have her executed this is this, this enemy of israel has come into our camp to bring in this detestable practice or remember this is a time in the judges where people did what was right in their own eyes boaz could take advantage of ruth in this moment and be sexually violent and have nothing wrong said against him as a jewish man what I want you to gather from this plan in this moment is that it is very risky for Ruth to believe her Jewish mother-in-law's word and fulfill the plan that she's saying to fulfill. Yeah. 
And the only reason why she's willing to do it, don't miss this, is because she has confidence in the integrity of Boaz. The reason why Ruth would step out and trust Naomi's word is because both women have a sense of confidence in the kind of man that Boaz is. They are depending on him to be a kind man when she shows up there. And followers of Christ, can I let you know that we have confidence in Jesus Christ, our Savior, in his kindness, in his integrity, that when God calls us to do something, we say, I'm going to step out and I'm going to trust you because I know that you are a good God, because I know that you have good plans for my life. See, Ruth is just showing us what it means to trust in the Lord. Let me ask you a question you can consider for this week. How could you step out and take a risk and trust the Lord in a certain area of your life? Maybe there's something you're just holding on to, you're holding back on. Maybe it's your relationships. God's calling you to be a trailblazer amongst your friends. You're saying, yeah, but if I do that, things might get a little weird. Step out and trust the God of kindness. Maybe it's in your finances. You're holding on so tight and you're saying, yeah, but if I let go of some, I'm going to have less. And God's saying, yeah, but my math isn't like your math. I can do more with 90 than you can with 100. Step out and trust me. Have confidence in my goodness. I'm provider. Maybe it has to do with just your lifestyle, your choices, forgiving someone. Yeah, but culture tells me I should cut that person out, block them, unfriend them, and never talk to them again. And God's saying, would you trust in my kindness that I'm the God who can restore even the most broken relationships? You may feel like your marriage has no hope today, and yet God's saying, step out and trust me, honor that spouse, and watch how I restore the relationship. And so Ruth is saying, I'll trust you. I'll step out. In fact, here's what she says in verse five. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. And notice, here it is. Here's the description. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile and Ruth approached quietly. And she uncovered his feet and she laid down next to his toes. (laughs) I just want you to see how weird this is. (laughs) But she does it. She does it. And again, we're getting a description of what I guess was normal at this time. But I don't want to read the next verse because I want you to understand. I want, I, I want our heart rate to go up like Ruth's would. Because it would. This is a non-Jewish woman who doesn't know this custom. Who, who has never done this before. Who's never seen this in practice. And now she's approaching. And there's a whole lot of guys in that place. Because notice Naomi said, make sure you note the place he lies. Like, you're going after the one. You're going after your Boaz. You're not just settling for any guy that's available right now, Ruth. Can I speak a little bit into culture's language? Culture says, who completes you? Who makes you feel good? Just figure it out. Just hook up. Have sex together. See if it feels right. Live together. Try it before you buy it. And then if not, you can move on to the next person. God's plan is no. Marriage, covenant, promise. And Naomi says, look for the one. Go to him. Her heart's got to be racing in this moment as she lies down not knowing what's going to happen next. I didn't hear the rest of the story. All I was told was he'll tell you what to do. What am I doing? Going to his knees next? Like, where does this thing go? I have no idea what's going to happen. So what does Boaz do? He said, who are you? I wonder how he said it because we don't get the tone in the text. Like, was he, who who are you? Like rubbing the sleepy dust out of his eyes? Was he, who are you? My feet are cold. What's going on? And she answered, I'm Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a, say this word with me, redeemer. redeemer. Okay, again, something a little weird is taking place. This is not normal. Now, there's aspects of this that is not normal, not just the verbiage and the language that's used. There's aspects because here it is, we have two single individuals coming together at night and we don't know if they're going to have sex or not. What's normal is they would just hook up. It's normal. See if they're compatible. See if he's still there in the morning. Maybe, maybe try it again. Work things out. But she goes and she uses this phrase, which implies she's not looking for sex or for a hookup. She says, spread your wings over me. Now, I don't know when the last time was that you said that to your spouse. I don't think I've ever said that. In fact, What she's doing here is she's proposing to him. 
This is cool. This is a Jewish idiom, a Jewish phrase that would be used, not typically by women though, it would be by the men saying, I will spread my wings over you because they would follow the language of Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of Israel, who says, under your wings, you will find trust. And so they grabbed onto this language where they would say, I'll spread my wings over you. In other words, I'm not just here to hook up with you. I'm not here to meet your need to fulfill my need. I'm here to be provider, to be redeemer, to gather you up and for the two to be united as one flesh. Notice what she's saying. Marry me. She's proposing. As some of you, maybe you're on the verge of proposing. I just gave you your one line, everybody. <laughs> Go ahead, get down on one knee. So spread your wings over me. Uh, when I proposed to Amy, I was 19 years old. We married for 12 years this August. And uh, I did not use the phrase, spread your wings over me at all. I was more normal. So we have a picture of it. I showed up at the airport. There's a little 19 year old Keith. And uh, with two dozen roses and got down on one knee and said, Amy, will you marry me? I asked her dad, scariest moment of my life, a couple weeks prior to that. And, um, but I, I do want to just point out a few things about this photo that was taken um, the first thing is this. I don't know who that guy is in the middle, <laughs> but he's happier than we were that we were getting married. Like, that's awesome. Just, you know, you do one of these things and all of a sudden there's a circle around you in the airport. So I'm glad, I'm calling him Bob. He looks like a Bob. Bob is so excited. Um, the other thing I want to note, not as exciting, is notice the cell phone holder on the belt clip, everybody. <laughs> Who's happy that those are not legal anymore? Come on, right? It's just... That's awesome. This was years ago. And, that's, and you can see that, that phone I was rocking didn't have any sort of technology. It was just, you could play Snake. Like, that was the best thing about those phones. Like, yeah, Snake. Um, but I never said, spread your wings over me. But what I did say was this, will you marry me? Will you marry me? Will we enter into covenant that honors the Lord? Will we come together, the two as one flesh? And it's what Ruth and Boaz are doing in this moment. See, Ruth wants marriage. Ruth wants God's plan for her life and for Boaz's life. She's not going there saying, just meet my need. C come on, I I'm here for you. No, she's saying, marry me. And both of these individuals are acting out of integrity. See, let me explain why believers, if you're a Christ follower, why we hold sacred marriage. God ordained, God created one man and one woman marriage is because it is the singular symbolic picture that God has created and given us that shows the love that Christ has for the church. That's why marriage is sacred. That's why marriage matters. If your response today is, I don't need a piece of paper to show that I love someone, I would agree with you there and say, I don't need that paper either. In fact, that's the lowest bar on the ladder of marriage for me. I don't need a piece of paper. I don't need to be married in the eyes of the state. What I need is to show this world how Christ is united to the church and how he's in covenant with us. And God has given us this picture of marriage. And there's other plans. Like we start off, there's your plan, there's culture's plan, there's, there's other plans. We look at this and say, what's God's plan for relationship? What's God's plan for sex and marriage? And these two individuals are going to act out of integrity. And so Ruth says, spread your wings because you are a redeemer. In other words, you have the ability to make me new, to set me free from this path that I'm on as a Moabite widow in Jewish territory. So what does Boaz say? Verse 10, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor. Now, what we're seeing in this moment is exactly what we still see today in culture, is that culture is selling sex like it's a commodity. Culture is saying, go after whoever makes you feel good, feel complete. And if they don't make you feel good or complete anymore, just go after another person. Maybe they're younger, maybe they've got more money, and then you'll feel a certain way. And Boaz recognizes, Ruth, you're acting with integrity. You could have went after anybody, and yet here you are. Because it's not just about finding anybody. There's a plan. And he says, and now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. I love this. Ruth has a reputation, a good one, being someone of noble character. Although it is true, 
we're going to get a glimpse at the character of Boaz. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. And here it is, my friends. We have the plot twist. We've got your typical chick flick unfolding. We've got the guy. We've got the girl. We want them together. But then there's the other guy. We're going to call him chapter four, all right? Because next week we're going to discover all about who the other guy is, all right? But here, it's like, but look at this. This is the integrity of Boaz. Boaz has oppor- so many opportunities right now. Whose plan will he carry out in this moment? He can fill his own sexual desire and take advantage of Ruth and send her home the next morning without any obligation to marry her. He could do that. He could say, forget that other guy. You know what? You're here now. You do the whole spread your wings thing. My feet are cold. I'll marry you. Don't worry about the other guy. But Boaz, like Ruth, is living a life of integrity. They're both living to honor the Lord. And so here it is, while Boaz could execute some of those plans, selfish and cultural, he says, no, I know God's plan. God's law has said, and here's what it means, that Elimelech, Naomi's former husband who passed away, has closer relatives than Boaz, who rightfully, according to the law, should be next in line to redeem Ruth and Naomi to purchase the property, and to marry Ruth. And so he says, although I am a kinsman redeemer, I'm not the closest. There's someone else in line. He didn't have to share that. Yeah, that's right. But he's got integrity. That's right. And so here's what he says. I love this. Such a gentleman. Stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. What he says is this. Here's the promise. Ruth, I promise by tomorrow you're going to have a redeemer in your life. Whether it's me or he, somebody is going to redeem you. He's providing for her in this moment. He's saying, you stepped out. You took a risk. You had confidence in my kindness and my integrity. And here it is. He's next in line. We're going to talk to him tomorrow. And if he won't, I will. And there's nothing in the Hebrew language. Notice at the end of that verse, it said, stay the night. Just so we can break down that, there's nothing in the original Hebrew that implies anything sexual took place that night between the two of them. The two of them honored God in that moment. And he acts with integrity, and so does she. So, verse 14, she lay at his feet until morning. And look at this. But got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. What's going on? I thought Boaz had integrity. Why is he trying to hide her now? He recognizes that he wants to protect her dignity and her reputation in this moment because women don't go to the threshing floor. She took a risk and stepped out and had confidence in his kindness. And now he's saying, before sunlight comes up, because nothing happened, and before the rumor mill starts, we're going to get you out of here because I'm not going to have you going back being accused of being a Moabite prostitute. He's caring for her. He cares about her reputation and her dignity. He's not looking to parade around the men like it's a sauna, the threshing floor. Yeah, I had Ruth here last night. Being serious, right? He's not looking to do that. No, we're going to make sure you're out before anyone sees you. He doesn't just provide for her dignity. He also said, bring me the shawl and wear, you're wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her, and then he went back to town. Now, if you remember last week, Joe shared with us that Boaz provided 30 pounds of barley. Now he's providing 60 to 90 pounds of barley. So in my mind, Boaz is an awesome fitness trainer. He's just like, Ruth, we had you at 30 last week. It's time to up your weight. We're going 60 to 90. Let's load this up on your back. Let's see how far you can go back with how much. But look at him. I mean, look at, guys, what we're seeing here is a godly man. Can I get an amen from some ladies to say I want a godly man in, the, in their house? Men, can I get an amen to say I want to be a godly man? Because that's who we're called to be. And what we're seeing here is a godly man. Someone who doesn't take advantage of another woman. Someone who honors her dignity. Someone who cares and provides for her. And can I speak to those of you who are married men? This is the beautiful blessing we have as married men. 
not a burden to crush us, but Paul writes in Ephesians, men, love your wife as Christ loves the church. Honor her, care for her, provide for her. This is our calling. It's a blessing to be a godly man, to be a man of integrity, for your wife to know that when you say you're going somewhere, you're going to that place. For your wife to not wonder and question, why is he coming home late again? For your wife to not wonder, why won't he care for me? Why won't he provide for us? And single men, this is something you start now. This isn't something that you say, oh, once I'm married, then I'll take care of this. Then I'll get my stuff together. Then I'll start acting out of integrity. You don't reap a lifestyle of blessing built on a foundation of sin today. You build on the foundation of integrity today. Guys, start making the decision today to honor the Lord, today to live with integrity and allow God to lead you and unfold his plan in your life. So that's what I got for the men. For the ladies, I got some biblical advice that I came across in my time of study for this message. So here it is. Ruth patiently waited for her mate Boaz. And while you are waiting on your Boaz, don't settle for any of his relatives. Broke as, Poaz, lying as, cheating as, dumb as, drunk as, cheap as, locked up as, good for nothing as, lazy as, and especially his third cousin beating your ass. Wait on your Boaz and make sure he respects your ass. Can I get a good amen from some ladies in the house? Come on. There's only one church on Long Island where that can go. That's all right. We'll keep our reputation intact, trust me. All right. I got you laughing for a couple minutes, and so now I'm going to hit you with some seriousness while you still, still like me. Church, we are not called to conform to the patterns of this world. We are not called to say, yeah, but culture says. Yeah, but everyone does it this way. Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, but these are the new rules for marriage, dating, sex, and relationship. We're called to be transformed through the renewing of our mind by God's word. And so there is a plan that you and I will live out of as it relates to marriage and sexuality. It will be cultures, it will be your own, or it will be God. It's going to be his plan, or it's going to be yours. And so here it is, as we see the world around us changing the rules and redefining sex and marriage and sexuality, we have a God who has already said, I've got the best plan for your life. I've already mapped out, here's the very best that I have for you. Here's what it looks like between one man and one woman to come together in covenant and to say, we are married. Spread your wings over me. I'm not looking for a need to be met. I'm going to wait on the Lord. And I get it. This is tough because it's so not culture. It's so not what we're used to. There's no Netflix originals coming out about this. It's mortgage or marriage. That's one. Oh, mortgage. That's a Netflix original. Watch. Well, this is how culture has redefined this. I promise kids are not being tortured behind the curtain. All right. We're all thinking it. So let me just throw it out there. They're all safe. They're fine. It's all good. Just keep up here. Keep up here, everybody. And we got like this hornet that's flying around. Anyone else see that at some point? It's like, woo, woo, we got birds flying. All right. Bring it back. We're having fun. So here's, here's my invitation to you. Seriously. Here's my invite. Whether you are single or married, whether you've said, I'll never get married, and so for you, you've just, you're living with someone, you're sleeping with someone. Maybe you're married and you're saying, but the intimacy in my relationship, not just sexual intimacy, but the connection, but the trust, but the love, but the fun, the excitement, all of that is waning. See, all of us get to, don't have to, get to grow in God's plan for our marriages and our singleness and sexuality. And as your pastor and as your pastor's, we want to grow with you. We want to champion you. This is not a church where we shame and blame one another. Can I get an amen from someone who knows that? We don't say you step into the light with your sin and we're going to kick you out of here. 
That's not Blaze Church. That's not our culture. We say with humility, help me discover God's best for my life. Walk with me. This is not normal. So you and I need each other. So here's what we've created. We have a text code. The word Blaze Marriage, one word, to 97,000. And I want to invite you to text it, or please, everybody should write this down because it's, again, it's not you saying, oh my goodness, I'm in sin, I need help. Don't let the enemy right now harden your heart so that you don't discover God's best plan for your life because he has a best plan for married couples, for singles, for those living together, for partners, whatever that looks like, however you defined it, God has a best plan for you. And by texting this, you don't get married on the other end. Imagine if you just speed marriage here at Blaze Church. Text it, you married, here's your certificate. It's none of that. This is you simply starting the conversation with your pastor so that we can pray with you and reach out to you and say, there are trained people in Blaze Church with a desire to see healthy marriages. We would love to walk with you and discover what that means for your life. Who thinks that's a good thing and not a bad thing? That we're saying, no, marriages are foundational. They are the picture of Christ and the church. And I'm not going to just sit and watch culture talk about marriage in a perverted way when God has the best way for our lives. And so we're going to speak up into it. We're going to make sure there's a foundation so that those kids on that side of the wall, who again are not being tortured, right, th- those kids, that they will look and say, there's healthy marriages in my home. Not perfect marriages. There's healthy marriages. That's my mom and my dad who are husband and wife because they believe in the sanctity of marriage. And so we want to walk with you. Blaze marriage to 97,000. If you're married, that's a great conversation to have with your spouse. Say, hey, let's text. Let's find out because we've got resources. We've got plans for this. We want to walk with you. And you watch as your marriage starts to grow. Let's finish up this moment with Ruth and Boaz. So when Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi, asked her, how did it go, my daughter? And then she told her everything Boaz had done for her. And added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And then Naomi said, say this word with me, wait, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. And what I love about this is that empty-handed Naomi at the end of chapter one is now receiving and is starting to get full. God's kindness and provision is being shown to her. And, the, and Ruth is, now she's in a place where now it's time to wait. You stepped out, you trusted, you acted with confidence. Now you wait. Watch him come through. Again, Boaz is that picture of the true and better Boaz, Jesus Christ. And those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And so the Christian walk and the Christian faith is constantly stepping out and trusting the Lord and waiting on him. And stepping out and saying, I know the plans you have, God, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to wait on you to fulfill everything you said. Why? Because you are faithful then and you'll be faithful now. That's our God. We have a true and better Boaz. In fact, the author of Hebrews says, let us then approach God's throne room of grace with, say this word nice and loud, confidence. He says, come to the Lord with confidence so that we might receive mercy and find God's grace to help us in our time of need. Too often, you and I don't go to God's throne room of grace with confidence because we think he's gonna wag his finger at us and shame us and be angry with us. And yet we get to go to God's presence with confidence knowing he is there giving us mercy, what we don't deserve, and grace. Saying, I love you. I've got a plan for you. And today, if you're finding that your sexuality, your marriage, your relationships are entangled up in a web of you plans and culture plans, don't allow the enemy to tell you not to go to God's throne room. He's trying to stop you from finding freedom, to getting healed up, to find rest- restoration in your marriage. Maybe for some of us here, your marriage feels so broken, so lost, and you're wondering if there's any hope. And God's saying, come to me with confidence because I'm the God who has mercy and grace to give you today. And so we're going to worship the Lord with a song called Run to the Father because we are invited to come to our God. The team can join me up here. And I want to say this to you. We all need to run to the Father today in some way. We all get to run to the Father today. Maybe for some of us here, being honest, not as trustworthy as Boaz. When given the right situation, or I should say the wrong situation, in the wrong moment, 
Integrity isn't the first response. Okay, so we're going to run to the Father today and say, Lord, I want to trust. I want to be trustworthy. I want to, I want to act out with integrity. Amen. Maybe it's some of us don't have the sexual integrity that Ruth had. Man or woman, just going around following culture's plan, saying, I'm going to have my needs met. I'm going to find someone who will satisfy me. Uh, I'm going to just kind of see that person that completes me. And if they don't, I'll move on to the next person. And there's pain and there's hurt in your past. Run to the Father. Some of us are in desperate need for provision like Naomi was. That today you need to come to the Lord with open hands because he's got 60 to 90 pounds of grain that he wants to bless you with. And that's his presence. That's, good. that's himself. Yeah. That's the joy of the Lord that is your strength. It's peace that goes beyond understanding. And if we would just come with a humble heart and say, God, I need you today, he'll say, I'll bless you. And some of us, and this is really the greatest one, we need the redemption that only Jesus can offer. Amen. That you're still living for you, that you've never had a moment where you said, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Save me, rescue me. And God's saying, I want to make you a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Yes. And today as you come to the Father, you're going to be made new. You're going to be born again as an adopted child of God. Right. And so all of us are going to run to the Father today. I want to invite you to stand up with me right now as we pray. God has a good plan. And I want to pray for those of us who need to be trustworthy, for those who are living sexually immoral lives, for those who are saying, I need God's provision today, for those who are saying, I need salvation today. We all get to come to the Father. And so, Lord, here we are, open hands before you, saying thank you. Thank you, Lord, for making us new today. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for joy Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for a plan that is not ours and not culture's. It is better than that. Lord, I pray that over every person today. I pray that Blaze Church would be a church that's filled not with perfect people, but people who have a perfect Savior. People who are trusting in a God who has said, here's the plan I have for your life. It's to prosper you. It's to bless you. It's to give you a hope and a future. And it's not found in following culture's way of sex and marriage and singleness. And so, God, we come before you with confessing hearts, with repenting hearts. I pray for the men in this space that we would live with integrity, that we would honor our spouses, that we would honor you in the way that we love. I pray for the ladies in this space, that they would honor their husbands and, and wait on you, Lord, for that one that you have for them. Jesus, you are our one. I pray right now for every person who needs to know you. And if that's you, you want to know Jesus as Savior today, I'm going to invite you to just pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Make me new. I surrender my life to you today. I want to be saved. In Jesus' name, we pray all this. Amen. Amen. Can we give God a good shout of praise this morning for the work His Holy Spirit's doing? We're going to worship the Lord right now with this song, Run to the Father. And if you want to know more about what it means to know Jesus today, our welcome team is going to walk around during this song. They'll have a little book in their hand. Just give them a wave. They'll come over and give you a what's my next step book for those who want to know Jesus today. But church, let's worship our God. Let's sing this out. You've carried this burden for so long, but you are not called to carry it on your own. You've got a Savior who came to this world, who died for you, who loves you. And so today we're running to our Father. Come on, let's worship Jesus.